Bienvenidos. Hola. Welcome, everyone. My name is Kabir Segal, coming to you live from the ATL, and I'm practicing my Spanish today, my not-so-good Spanish. Uh, look, I want to welcome you all for watching. Um, this is a, a very special edition of the Quarantine Series. I have a great guest um, that we'll be introducing in a moment. The Quarantine Series is all about shining the spotlight on creative people, really of all types, musicians, filmmakers, authors, we try to um, just, you know, say thanks to all these great folks who are creating the stories and the content that is um, adding some soul to our lives. You know, we're all streaming <laughs> all these projects now and we're appreciating them even more. So if you can support the projects we learn about on this broadcast, um, in addition, uh, think local, support those in your community, uh, the local bookshop that's been, um, that's, you know, struggling or, or the local film festival that may have been canceled. So let's try to be there for those in our community as much as we can. Um, all right, a couple of things. If you want to learn who will be on the show, pretty simple. Just subscribe to my social media and you'll be in the loop as to who's on and when they're on. And you can start studying about what questions you want to ask them and what's on your mind. Uh, let us know by dropping a comment in the comment field. And, and of course, uh, let us know where you're watching from. Uh, just drop a comment, uh, no matter if you're watching live or on the rebroadcast, let us know where you're tuning in from. Always great to know about all the international folks. So special uh, thanks to everyone watching abroad and special folks to the folks watching downstairs. Hi, mom and dad. Appreciate you for tuning in. Um, and so I think that's pretty much it for the opening opening spiel. Um, now, if you want to, um, um, one thing I want to say, if people were asking me how to get on the show, just shoot me a note on social media. We'll try to, to look into it. My uh, producer, Shane, and I, we, Shane has a very rigorous criteria as to who comes on. So um, we'll, we'll examine. So look, so now for the best part of the show, we will um, introduce the main event. The main event, he's an incredible award-winning filmmaker. He's a hyphenated individual, writer, director, actor. Um, his recent releases, which we'll talk about, um, in award-winning releases, I should say, Aquizaramo, see, I'm gonna practice my Spanish. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about Broken Sunflower Hearts. Um, his films have um, played at very august film festivals and please welcome to the quarantine series, the wonderful uh, Maven himself, Miguel Angel Caballero. Welcome. Thank you so much, Kabir. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And first, I got to ask you, Miguel, um, how are you doing? How are you doing uh, during this period of pandemic? And how is it affecting some of your projects? You know, to be quite honest, I feel that the pandemic has treated me exceptionally well. And also because I'm a, I'm a writer. So... I feel blessed that I have a space and I could just dive into my writing. Of course, like everything, you know, with family, there's been a few scares in my family, specifically my dad, who's older that, you know, during this pandemic, we weren't sure if he actually had uh, uh, contracted COVID-19 or not. So there's been those, but other than that, in terms of creativity, you know, like everybody else, I think for the first month, I was just, you know, shocked and, and didn't know what was happening. And then as we, you know, uh, uh, started going through it, I just realized, okay, so this is, uh, I could see it as a curse or a gift. And the gift that I chose to see it with is that I would have time now uh, to be at home and dedicate every single day to my writing. And that's what I've been doing pretty much. Well, I'm glad you're practicing the craft and honing honing your craft, sharpening the saw. Uh, tell us about those daily sharpenings. Um, what do you do every day? What's the typical day in quarantine? Do you wake up at the same time? Do you touch your toes every day? What's that routine like? So pretty much my typical day is I get up at 5.30 a.m. And, you know, I get up, wash up. I don't shower, but I splash water on my face, wash my face to make sure I'm awake. And then I do a meditation anywhere from 10 to about 20 minutes, depending on the day and depending on the meditation that I want to practice. And after that, I start, you know, make my coffee and I start writing. And my writing is every single day from 7.30 a.m. And I go till 10.30 unless I have some sort of deadline or I want to put in more hours. But between 7.30 and 10.30 is my sacred time. Phone is off, no interruptions. Um, I don't pick up. And that is my creative time. Wow. Was anyone in your family a Navy uh, drill sergeant? <laughs> I mean, that sounds I, great. I, I think I may have, you know, thrived in that, but nobody in my yeah, family. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to start calling you sergeant. Um, interesting. What was your daily meditation this morning about? 
Um, I usually practice Vipassana, which is, you know, going through your body and, and, and feeling it out and just being present with your breath. Uh, so usually I, I, you know, check in without any judgment, you know, maybe my shoulder hurts or there's something that's uncomfortable or I slept wrong, but the point is to just check through your body that, uh, and not judge it or try to move it or fix it. And then just focus on your breath. And this morning I just focused on my breath. And whenever I have, you know, a, a certain thought that takes me elsewhere, I take a moment and again, no judgment. And I just think, is this thinking or feeling? Um, and then if it's thinking, it's like, is it good or bad? It's a bad because I have this thing. Okay, it's fine. Bring it back to the breath. And I think that practice in the long run, it's just allowed me to, in my daily life, just be present in my journey. Because a lot of time as, you know, writers and artists and filmmakers, we kind of have a goal and we tend to stop living the present moment in hopes of achieving that goal. And then we realize when we get there, then we set another goal and it's going to be a bigger goal or a different goal. And we stop living in the present moment instead of just realizing that our journey itself is a gift. Our journey itself is something to appreciate because it is part of, of the whole in our, in our lives. Yes. Well, you'd be happy to know I am with you observing you in this moment and I'm observing myself observing you in this moment. So uh, we're here together. Uh, we do have a question. Um, uh, Juan, Juan Carlos is asking, uh, what do you write about in the mornings? So Juan Carlos, I, I'm a screenwriter. At, at the moment, I'm working on a feature film. So um, the feature, the, the short film that's been doing the rounds right now, I am now collaborating with my writing partner and we're doing a feature film. So it's been for the last two months that every single morning for the last five days, um, I've been writing the feature film version of this, but I have written other stuff. So it depends. It might be a TV show. It might be a feature film, but usually I go back and forth between TV and feature films. Um, and I guess one thing I should add also in case uh, Juan Carlos, in case you're curious, I was advised to do this and it really catapults my creativity into a different level. And for the first like 15 or 20 minutes before you start writing, read something creative, listen to an inspiring talk, listen to, you know, read 10 pages of a book that you really like, because it really sets your mind into this creative mode instead of just kind of, you know, rolling out of bed and sitting down and expecting creativity to come. For me, it's really helped me a lot to, to do that and then jump into the writing. And right now it's the feature film of Aquitaramo. And let's talk about that. That's a good segue. Aquitaramo, tell us, tell the audience what it's about and uh, how the story really came to you. So the story of Aquitzeramo is about an elderly man living in a small rural town in Mexico and his partner passes away. So he calls his partner's estranged son and they haven't seen each other in 20 years. And he tells him one, your dad has been living in this small town and two, he was gay and I was his partner. So this guy flies from Chicago to the small town in Mexico um, for his father's burial. And these two characters are challenged to see if through love, empathy, and compassion, they're basically strangers, if they could you know, bridge a cultural, generational, and you know, empathy gap that, that they lack and see if they could heal each other from the death of a loved one. And the story really came about, the town of Aquitaramo is an actual town in the state of Michoacan and in Mexico. And I actually grew up in that town and in the US, uh, six months in each country until I was about 12 or 13 years old. And I remember growing up there, there were you know older uh, men and women that were single and they never really married. And you know the story was that they never really found anybody that they could marry and they were single all their lives. So, you know, as I, as I grew older and I started reflecting back on this town of, you know, these folks, and as I started accepting myself as a gay man, I started thinking really, was it that they never really found anybody or were they just not allowed to love openly the person they wanted to love? So I started writing the story about this elder living in this small town and how he, he loses friends once people start realizing that he's gay. Because a lot of times, you know, the goal of the film was to shine a light on this segment of our community, not only in, the, in Mexico, but all around the world that nobody really takes into account, which is gay elders and how do they live. And we, we, we tend to, you know, push them out of our 
our families, our community, you know what I mean? There's this, this sense of invisibility when you get older that nobody really takes you into account. So that's the, the purpose and that's how the story came about of telling about this man living in a small town. So I do think that Acuizeramo is a story of one town, but it really uh, 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 represents every town, every community, every family where love and tolerance is lacking. So I think, you know, my goal was to make it universal and not just, it's a very specific town, but my goal was to make it a universal story. Certainly seems that way. Uh, thanks for sharing. I want you to put your producer hat on. Tell us about the creative team and how you sort of rounded out um, your team to make sure you had the best talent to make this project happen. So up until the, the 25th hour of, of our fundraising campaign with this film, we didn't have enough money to shoot it. And luckily, you know, things just kind of fell into place and we still didn't have as much money. We had people from the U.S. Uh, uh, fly in. We had people from Mexico City, which were the camera crew and the equipment. And we have some people from the state of Michoacan. So usually in every project that I do, I have a shadow mentoring program along with my producing partner, Luis Aldana, who's the lead in the film as well. He's a younger, the younger one in the film. So we have a, a shadow mentoring program where we go out and we reach out to communities that are you know, specifically underserved communities that don't have like a very strong film department or a film department at all in high school. And we bring them on board into our productions to sort of demystify what filmmaking is. Because me, myself, I'm, I'm the son of, of Mexican farm workers who, you know, like my, my resources in high school were very limited. I never stepped on set until, you know, I was 18 years old, but that's because I started acting. Um, so I didn't know what this was at a young age and it seemed like very a far-fetched dream. So what we do with the shadow mentoring program is we get kids on board, uh, high school usually, and we bring them on set, we pair them with the actor, we pair them with the director or the producer. And for a day they ask questions, they see that, you know, anybody could really do it, you know, that it's not that this dream, this pipeline dream that you can't achieve. So with this particular film, Acuizeramo, I didn't have money for the key players. I, I didn't have money for the, one of the main players, which is like a script supervisor, um, an assistant director, a production manager. So um, there was four uh, vacancies that I, I couldn't afford to take from the US. So what I did is I decided to merge the mentoring program in a more college um, uh, level. So I went to speak to a director of a university in Morelia in the state of Michoacan. And I asked, them, asked her, look, I'm doing this film. I usually have a mentoring program and I'm willing to mentor four of your students that are willing to come on board. I will do the work for them. I will sit with them before, before production. I will nurture them. And once they come on set in these leading roles, I will be there every step of the way. So I was also director, producer, and kind of involved in every department. So I got the students and before I left, I went into every department, uh, script supervisor, I went into assistant director and I made a folder of all the information that they were going to need and how, and a sort of how to. So when I got to Mexico, I met with every single one and I gave them a crash course in filmmaking. Um, they had studied film, but I made, gave them a crash course in, in specifically in how we do films here in the US. And I guided them through the entire thing and they came on board into key positions. And it was just a blessing. It was the, you know, the best thing that could have happened. They were, they were very eager to learn. They said they had an amazing time on set and it really helped us be able to tell this story with their help. So it was a sort of a give and take synergy that we had with these students. And that's how, in terms of crew, that's how they, they, my crew completed. Wow, I love the origin story and how it all came together. It's certainly, uh, Amer these can be marathons and I'm glad you had a great team um, around you. It recently, the swim uh, recently won an award, right? Yes, we've, we've traveled, um, you know, we're at the end of our, our festival run, but the film actually, you know, initially I was a little hesitant because I didn't, I didn't know if it was going to translate, even though I wanted to tell a universal story. And I told my producing partner, let's just not expect a lot. It is in Spanish mostly, except for the last scene. So let's just, you know, write it out and be thankful that we did this story and see where it lands. The film has played at over 40 festivals and it's wow. won 15 awards. 
including Best Short at the American Pavilion at the Cannes Film Festival and the Imagen Award here in the US, which is um, a prestigious award for the Latinx community. Uh, so it's it's gone, it's it's caught wildfire and it's this is like beyond a dream of all the places that it's been to and mostly because I just, all we wanted to do in making this film is share it and spread love and spread you know empathy to folks that were open and willing to see the film. And I think these festivals have definitely served as a platform for us to share this story. And we're super grateful of every single festival that we've played at and every recognition as well that we've gotten. Yeah, well, congratulations. And you deserve all the all the incredible, let's just look at here. Juan Carlos is saying felicidades. Uh, so getting Thank congratulations you. to the audience. So um, let's talk, switch gears and talk about some of your other projects, Broken Sunflower Notes, uh, what a special project this is. Tell us a little bit about it and what the audience should know about it. So this was, I'll go a little bit back. So I, I started off as an actor when I was 15. And then I started noticing that, you know, I, I didn't like the idea that my career was in other people's hands and I felt really helpless. So I, I started producing a lot. I produced a lot of shorts for a company that I used to have in the past. And we did shorts and we produced a feature film with them as well. And then there was a moment that came that I felt, you know, I'm just not getting as much satisfaction from acting as I am from like my passion was to write and, and tell these stories that had the urge of coming out of me. So I stopped what I was doing and I switched gears and I started writing and directing and Broken Sunflower Hearts is actually the first film that I, I outside of college that I wrote produced and directed and you know it, we feature the same character anthony as in the film of aquiceramo and it's about a single uh, gay father who's raising his daughter on his own and you know a year after their breakup there his ex shows up at the door and you know he's he's try, trying to get back together trying to to maybe mend their past so it's a story about you know, uh, the alchemy of love, I like to say, when you have a breakup and you know that you can't be together, but there's a lot of love, there is a transformation or an alchemy that happens in terms of a friendship. And then, I mean, I, I'm sorry, a, 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 a love relationship in terms of, of mates. And then when it transitions into a friend, and there's also a daughter involved between both of them. So I really wanted to tell this story. It's loosely based on my experiences as a gay man, I, I don't have a daughter, but but it's based on my relationships in the past. Sometimes when a relationship ends, um, you still love the person. The love does not go away. You don't hate them. You don't want them to go away. But how does it transition into a friendship love? And it's just very heartbreaking um, when the love exists on both sides, but you realize that you just cannot be together in that way. So that's Broken Sunflower Hearts is about that, about the alchemy of love. What was the initial audience uh, response to the project? I'm intrigued by this story. It, people love the story and they loved it because they've, they said that they, they've never seen a story of two men raising a daughter and the consequences of that. You see a lot of, you know, uh, hetero stories um, or, or I guess you could, yeah, like straight stories of a child being involved. So a lot of people really appreciated the fact that I had done a story, not only because of the content and lo the love between these two characters, but that there's a daughter involved. And what do you do when that happens in a gay relationship? So the response to it also was really, really um, overwhelming. And we also did an entire you know, film festival run and we went throughout the world and it garnered a few awards as well. So yeah, it's it, it was really a blessing, and it also kind of fueled me um, to believe in myself and and to 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 know that I had some stories worthwhile that were telling, and you know it 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 planted me as a director that now you know with Aquitzeramo I went off and you know I had the confidence of I know what I'm doing I've been in this business for so long and I've. I've done the work, so it it really helped, and I I feel broken. Sunflower Hearts is the beginning of my writer director career, and when I veered off, I like when you I like how you veer though. You veer into some really nice projects. Um, <laughs> you do, you do. Uh, let's talk about one more uh, cry now. Tell us about this project. 
So Cry Now is the first feature that I actually produced. I had produced along with my partners, Alberto Barbosa and Luis Aldana. Uh, we had produced other shorts and Cry Now was uh, my first producer, um, uh, feature film producer uh, project that I did. It was written by Alberto Barbosa and directed by him as well. And it's the story about a street artist that, you know, he's trying to find his way. He's trying to find himself and he falls in love with a tattoo artist. And we follow their journey through the underground music of Los Angeles to see if you know they actually can end up together. So Alberto did an amazing job in terms of like really being authentic of you know the, the, the music places that we see in Los Angeles. The interesting thing about this movie is that you know, like like everything, you just never know where it's going to end up. But it it had um, a couple distributors, and one of them um, sort of went out of business or bankrupt or whatnot. So this film is actually stuck until twenty twenty three until it's going to be available for the public. So nobody has really seen the film outside our premiere and outside of a few private screenings. So we're all really looking forward to sharing this film t with everybody. But as of now, you know, it's it, unfortunately there's going to have to be a longer wait because it's stuck in a sort of distribution hell, <laughs> if you will. Yeah, I hear you. Well, I want to um, get your website up here so people can learn about you and find out where to to discover your projects. Well, there's your Twitter handle, Miguel on hell one 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 one. Um, you can also go to his website. And I really think it's important to, to see his website because you can learn about the incredible uh, portfolio projects that you have. Um, really a pleasure to have you on the show, Miguel. Thank you, Kavir. It's such a pleasure to be here and thank you so much for having me. All right, that's our show today, everyone. Uh, make sure to subscribe to my social media to learn who will be on the show and uh, make sure to take care of yourself. It's tough out there. All right, take care, everyone. Have a good night.